<笑> OK， 那我想先请 Project Lockdown 的团队，呃，是不是如果可以听得到我们的声音，是不是可以跟大家打个招呼，然后开始今天的演讲？I guess you could say I'm a founding member of the project, or close to that.、Um, I was in it, I think, from you know close to the start. And today we have the wonderful Judy Green, our team research coordinator, and Mandy Cham, or one of our great researchers, and also coming from Net Mission.、Uh, check out this project; it's a great initiative in the in the Asian region.、Uh, so, if you could move forward,、um, you might be asking yourself, what is Project Lockdown? And I have to say that it is an evolving project. So we are a global initiative of a lot of people who haven't met each other, and who are very interested in human rights and in making sure that people are okay. You know, making sure that everybody is doing fine. And the way we want to do that is by mapping policies around the world and measuring their impacts on human and digital rights. And to do that, we follow quite a strict methodology、um, of selecting our sources carefully and being mindful of the kind of information we are putting in our database. So、um, we started as a COVID project, but as we will see on the next slide, if you could, Julie, we did start、uh, with with this platform very focused on the NPIs, which is. Non-pharmaceutical interventions. It's just a pretty way of saying everything that happened around the pandemic. So when people were isolated in their homes, when people had to respect curfews, when the different transportation systems were under control,、uh, those kinds of things are what we call non-pharmaceutical interventions, and we are still tracking、uh, those. But we have been expanding because we see that this project has a lot of potential to go in different directions. So, Judy, if you could move forward,、uh, we have a general approach to how we're going to do this, and it's the same one we have been following for for COVID,、uh, which is that we focus on rights, we focus on well-established rights, and we. Try to stick as best as possible to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and when we look at this、uh, from an objective perspective, there are a lot of different rights around the world. Yes, and there's a lot of things that are going on in relation to the pandemic, around the pandemic, and in the world in general. So, how do you actually turn this into something that people can understand? Right, and what you see behind us, this background, is a, is the interactive map we've come up with. It's an interactive map that tells you what is going on in terms of the, the different human rights around the world, and we do that using government sources.、Uh, we try to stick to that because whatever it is, it is the official narrative. So it is the way to hold governments accountable. Is by if there is an inconsistency, you can point out to that. And we have been moving towards also enabling、um, subregions. You know, as we know, many countries have different situations across their their, their extension. I can say, coming from Brazil, that it's not exactly、uh, even <laughs> when you go all the way from the 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 bottom of South America to the all the way to the to the top of it. And it's the same in a lot of regions.、Um, so moving on, Julie, if you could, please. Um, we have. It's the, yeah. This is the operational framework, but it might be a little bit、uh, tiny to see. So instead, I will explain it with the next slide, which, yes, that's more informative. 
So in this slide, you can see what we actually look like. What are we actually doing here? And this is the map, right? And when you look at that map, you can see that there's different colors to it. And this dynamic is how we surface the data in a way that normal people who are not very in tune in, with policies and who are not necessarily super specialized can actually see and say, okay, this area is in this situation and this area is in that situation. So everything comes together in, in what you're seeing right here. What we were saying about COVID, for example, uh, when you select a certain aspect of the of the COVID pandemic, and you know, in a sense, our main thing was were the lockdowns, right? So when you look at the lockdowns, what does it mean if it's yellow? If it is yellow, it means that there are lockdowns, some kind of lockdown. When it's green, it means there are no lockdowns, and when it's red, it means the whole country is locked down. And there were red countries uh, throughout the history of the project. We have mapped that happening in different countries. Um, out of the top of my head, I can definitely think of India and Argentina, some countries that really people were locked into their homes. So it's it's a visual way to, 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 to really understand policies. Uh, if we could move on to the, to the next one. But why do that? Right, and and I think that from the start, our discussion has been that this needs to be more than just a tool um, for for people to understand. That's the important part. But then they need to understand and be able to do something about it. If they see something there that somehow feels to them that it, that it's either um, problematic or that they agree or that they see as an example they need to be able to take that example and do something with it. They need to be able to bring it to their community. They need to be able to act upon that. So by bringing those government sources, as we were saying, um, it, it just builds that possibility with different things that we may be able to bring to this platform. If we bring anything, you know, one of my ideas was talking about uh, hunger around the world. And maybe you see that the the hunger index in a country is very serious and the, the one right next to it is very okay and you may ask yourself why is that right why is one so bad and the other the, the other is doing fine that's the kind of question that you can visually narrate and then get people thinking so next slide please and this is kind of a summary of um what i have been saying we try to cover uh, as many ter territories as, as is possible. We try to keep a strong focus on rights. We want to interact with people. We want to bring people in and get their data in, get their contributions in, and anybody can join the project actually. So uh, you can literally just approach us and say, you know, I want to contribute in whatever way I can. I, 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 can, re I can get the data, I can code, I can do the visual work, whatever it is, we're very open to that. And so openness is one of the key words of this project, right? Being very open, very open and, and holding a team that is open in that way, that actually allows people to participate and be active uh, in its development. And the next slide it will be my final one for now in which we measure the different uh, uh, initiatives and activities that are going on that are somehow similar to Project Lockdown. And we are one of the projects that are doing something along those ways, but we like to think that with how encompassing we are and the kind of openness that we have, um, we are building something good. So I will end for now and take this straight to Judy Green, um, who will be talking a little bit more about the specifics of the project. So over to you, Julie. Thanks, Mark. So um, I'm speaking to you today from um, Kampala uh, in Uganda. It's a beautiful day here. 
Um, so what I want to talk about is a little bit about uh, what we've been doing on the research team um, and some of our insights and our findings. Um, and I think what's been really interesting is that this is an incredibly organic um, project that's changing um, a lot over time. And we're seeing that as the new, as different waves hit, um, the kind of measures that governments have done has been very different. So I think when a, the pandemic very first hit, we had what we might describe as very clean measures. It was often at a federal um, level. So it was very kind of uh, centralized. Um, and it didn't begin to get complex until the easing started. And then countries uh, like New Zealand um, and Canada, who had these very detailed roadmaps with, you know, multiple, it could have been as, ma as many as six different phases, um, of, and they had, you know, as things were, were easing off. Then as the second wave hit, um, I think in some ways, um, some of the countries weren't so prepared, they weren't so ready for it. Um, so the measures were a little bit more um, um, confusing, confusing um, much, much more, more decentralization, decentralization. So, so it made, it made our, our job, job a lot harder, harder because, because instead, instead of, being of being able, able to, to say, well, okay, okay, this is what was happening, happening um, across, across all of Switzerland, Switzerland it, was it was now, now happening, happening in cantons, cantons um, in, in Switzerland, Switzerland and, 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 and that, that kind of thing. thing. So, so um, a lot of countries changed their strategy as well. And uh, so, so, for example, for example um, Sweden, Sweden, who had, who had been, been very relaxed, relaxed in, the in the very first, first wave, wave um, they've, they've now, now um, changed, changed their strategy, their strategy. Um, um, whereas, whereas uh, others, others like, like Australia um, and countries like Israel, um, they very much, uh, they had a very kind of strict uh, strategy from the beginning and they've, and they've kept with that. Now, the third wave hasn't hit all countries. Um, Iran was the first country that the third wave of COVID um, hit. Um, and we're starting to see the UK is already predicting um, that early next year, sort of January, February, they will have their third wave. Um, and this is much more reactionary. Um, and so, uh, again, we're seeing, you know, even, even more confusion and, and more difficulty. Another thing that's very important um, from, uh, from our point of view is also what's the legal status of each of the countries. So um, what we find is that some of the territories actually already had a kind of state of emergency, you might call it, um, in place. So um, Somalia is an example. Albania is another example. They had an earthquake in November 2019, and they declared state of natural disaster. But that was still going. So when COVID hit Albania, that declaration was in place, and they just kept with it. Um, so you can see the, the kind of legal ramifications that that could be different in terms of Just evoked uh, various things within the Public Health Act. Uh, so here are some uh, more examples. Um, you'll see that the Philippines, some territories have uh, put this in place for a very long time. So the UK had been the one that had done it for the longest. It was April, April of next, next year. year. But you'll, but see, you'll see, see that the, the Philippines, Philippines has, has now extended, extended it until September, September um, of, of next, next year, year as, well. as well. But then, but then you'll, you'll also, also see, see some territories, territories like Sweden, Sweden and, and Brunei, Brunei that, 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 didn't, didn't, that didn't declare, declare anything. anything. So I'll so hand, hand over, over to, to Mandy, Mandy, who's been, been very, working, working very, very intensively, intensively um, on uh, uh, the provinces, the provinces um, uh, within China. So thank you, Mandy. Thank you, Julie. Good afternoon. I'm Mandy, and I'm currently based in Hong Kong and currently responsible for analyzing and researching for PRC and the Chinese provinces. So just now, Julie has shared the different approaches uh, of government measures over time. And we also have territories that take a very different um, approaches that deviates from the previously mentioned trend, which is China. And that's why in this session, I'll show more on this special case and the challenges we have during the research process so that you can better understand the complexity behind. So just to give you an overview of our work progress, we have 31 provinces in our database and right now we have nine provinces with mostly government sources that cover around half a year. 
but we still have to work on replacing um, media sources for 14 provinces and researching for eight provinces with no sources in our database yet. And so next slide, please. So going back to what I mentioned before, PRC is very different from other territories by the approach it takes. It sort of go another way around from the approach of the third wave to the first wave. So what does this mean? It means that PRC started from a relatively reactionary measures to more uniform responses based on the guidelines issued from the top. And to give you some of the background information, in China, both the central governments and the provincial governments are responsible in managing the disease. But under the centralized administrative style, the state council and PRC is much more influential. It issues guidelines for provincial governments to follow. And here are some similarities and differences we found between PRC provinces. And you can see that the differences listed in the right columns were mainly observed in the beginning of the outbreak. So when um, comprehensive guidelines were not yet prepared by the state council, and at that time guidelines are provided only on how to control the epidemic and what measures to implement. But without specifying how to implement the measures, the provincial governments had more flexibility over the stringency and the extent of border control. That's why we see provinces adopting different transport um, measures. Um, for example, some decided to ban all cross provincial bus services while some decided not to. And we also see some lower level governments acting before the guidelines from the above was issued since immediate responses are required. And those measures later on appear to be in conflicts with those from the top and they have to be canceled later on. This explains how, like why the responses were more reactionary and localized. But later we observe some more similarities which are listed on the left hand side this is because the state council further refined their guidelines. They introduced different um, risk levels and they specify the measures to be implemented at different um, risk level. Therefore, there are, there's a high degree of similarity in their easing measures and in the way they respond to a local outbreak. And this also shows how the control is getting more and more centralized. And this complexity of the parallel Policy making makes PRC a very special case in our database. And apart from um, these interesting findings, uh, I'd also like to share with you some challenges we faced during the research process. So the first um, difficulties we have is the missing sauces. So sometimes sauces that we collected are completely removed from the government sites, or they are removed to some, they're moved to somewhere else on the official sites uh, before we input them to our data entry interface. And this create extra time calls because we have to replace them with media reports or um, announcement from uh, reposted by the city level governments. And there are also occasion where we cannot find the same information online, meaning that the original source is completely lost. And Another very interesting challenge is, is that uh, sometimes the same sauce can be traced to gov both government and media sauce. And here's an example we have, and you can see that these two articles actually have the same title. They have almost identical content, but they're reposed by different government bodies and with different sauces stated. And the left one posted earlier had a media sauce, while the right one posted later had an official sauce. Because of this, we often face challenges um, in deciding which sauce to use, whether we use the earlier one or we use the official one. And we also found announcement in PRC sometimes unclear, most of them, because most of them are guideline issues rather than measures from the top. Um, the implementation date is usually decided by um, lower level governments, and we often cannot find clear start and end dates. And some of the key measures are not uh, very well clarified as well. For example, um, uh, gathering activities are banned, but 
uh, we never see the exact number of what actually constitute a gathering. And we also have measures, measures that are unique to China and some provinces. For example, in Jiangxi, local um, officials were authorized to shut down the electricity and internet of entertainment places and internet cafes to make sure that they are not operating. And this uniqueness can hardly be captured by our DEI. So this is the end of my sharing on our findings and experience on researching for China's provinces. I'll now pass my time to Julie. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mandy. It's, it's fascinating. It's really, really interesting. Thank you. So I just want to guide you through um, a few more things, um, partly to kind of look at some of the solutions and, and what we're doing about all these challenges um, and the complexity that we've um, we've come across. Um, so one of the things that we'll be doing, and Mark showed you uh, the kind of mapping platform and what it looks like, but what we'd like to do is is kind of provide a two-level monitoring system. So we want to be able to, for people to be able to very clearly see when there's critical developments in terms of human digital rights and when there's developments um, to watch type thing. So just some um, examples um, that we're doing in terms of red flags. There's m many of them, um, but I think Mandy had alluded to this. Um, so what we would do is we would red flag because we feel that if governments are putting out these measures, but they're not clearly specifying um, a start, particularly a start date, but if there's no start date and no end date, or they're kind of unclear, or it's a little bit ambiguous. So we have the date of the announcement that's been made by the government, but we're not really sure um, when it's going to be starting. Um, and that could have, you know, real um, impact um, for, you know, harms to rights. Um, equally, um, we're going to flag off things like perhaps schools being closed um, for more than four months because then, you know, that right to education um, and particularly for, you know, uh, children in their critical schooling years, um, I think this has been devastating um, across the whole world. We do similar things perhaps like for closing of borders um, as well. Um, and we know that in some countries, even nationals um, have not been able to kind of go in and out of borders. Another area that we really focus on is, is this idea of unclear measures. Now, there are times where the government uh, posts things that could be contradictory um, within the post or within uh, multiple sources. Um, sometimes there's ambiguity, so it's not clear um, about what the actual measure is and how it might impact. Um, and so those are things that uh, we code into our um, database as unclear. And so again, this and these would be these would be uh, developments to watch, for example. I want to talk a little bit about um, the kind of how stringent um, and the the real um, potential for um, you know extreme um, harms to rights. Uh, in, in some of the territories that we've come across. Um, Australia is an example of this because they've been very, very harsh to the point where they haven't even let nationals in and out. Now that's unusual. Most territories allowed nationals to go in and out, but would stop foreigners. Um, but uh, Uganda, for example, um, they, much across Africa, Africa was very strict. They they hit early because they watched what had happened to China and to Europe. So Africa responded by kind of middle of March, most all African countries were shutting down. Um, and it was a very, very strict curfews were in place. Um, and so here in Uganda, uh, people couldn't even use private vehicles. There was no public vehicles, there were no private vehicles. Um, and so again, you'll see um, Eritrea, a very similar situation. We had some really highly militarized um, approach, uh, you know, India, Sri Lanka, um, Bangladesh. Um, Argentina was very strict, um, where everyone just had to stay home, much like Mark had said, uh, same with India um, as well. So in terms of impacts, there's huge impacts from these things. And I just want to focus on a, a couple of them. Um, Uganda, for example, um, you might think that banning private vehicles may not have particular, um, you know, damage to rights, but there were some real specific instances here. We had, within the first week of that ban, uh, six pregnant women um, died um, because what happened is with the private vehicles being banned, you had to get a letter from your local police unit um, that allowed you to get to the hospital. That was a difficult thing to do and it was time consuming. The women didn't have time, so these women were dying en route, uh, trying to walk to the hospital. Um, and a similar thing too was, um, in terms of stringent measures, was that 
marketplaces, uh, people were not allowed to go home. And if you can uh, imagine these markets are often along roadsides, sometimes tucked away, um, but usually very open, very unsafe places. Typically, they tend to be women um, because they were only allowing people who were selling food um, to do this. Um, and so what it meant was that these women, not only were they, you know, in unsafe, uh, polluted areas, but they were away from their family um, and their children, you know, for sort of, you know, two months more type thing. Um, we've seen lots and lots of um, heavy handedness as well um, across countries targeting of journalists, um, police abuse, um, targeting of LGBTQ plus groups um, in Argentina, it happened in Uganda as well. But just to kind of come back to this as well is that um, in terms of these red flags, um, it's also quite difficult. It's not, it's not an easy thing to know, um, you know whether it is a red flag or whether it isn't a red flag. Um, and I just, just kind of drawing your attention to this, you know, with the private vehicles, because on the surface, you know, you may not think um, that it would harm rights, um, but as you sort of start to, to dig in and, and, and hear the stories, it, it very much does. The other thing I want to just also say is that, yes, there's been um, a lot of harms to rights, and I think governments generally haven't really taken rights into account. It's been a, it's been a public health push um, rather than rights, but there have been some what we call positive deviants, um, and we've kind of broken them into like a community approach and a caring approach. Now, Taiwan really broaches both. I think Taiwan has, they've, they've used community initiatives, they've sent out care packages um, throughout, so they've had that caring they've been very transparent, um, updated the public um, regularly and that sort of thing. Sweden and Estonia had uh, very much a community approach in terms of, in a way, they put it back on the people because they trusted the people. They trusted people to do the right thing without them having to put in, you know, lots of lots of measures and that kind of thing. South Korea um, has been quite amazing as well. Um, they, again, much like Taiwan, they've been very, very um, informative uh, to the people. Um, they've uh, paid for all costing of tests, of COVID tests and that kind of thing, which has also been quite unusual. Um, they've done some quite novel things, like they did a drone art event uh, to kind of... Um, encourage people and to also thank them for things that they've done. In Portugal, um, some of their caring, uh, any, anyone who was pending residency, um, asylum seekers, um, they provided them um, a, a, effectively like they were permanent residents. So they, they got access to the public health system um, throughout uh, COVID. Um, uh, Bahrain, for example, um, they paid all the water bills. Japan and Kosovo um, are deferred. Uh, utility bills uh, during COVID. Uh, the UK did an amazing, they rolled out a furlough system where they were paying people 80% of their wage. So there's been some good things. Um, and it doesn't mean that the, you know, these places necessarily, like the UK has also done um, some very stringent stuff, but, you know, they've also shown um, a lot of care. One of the things that we've also tried to look at is how do we capture some of this and really present it in a very visual way? Um, so what you'll see here is you'll see nine different uh, territories across the world. Um, and what we've done is we've looked at the level of freedom effectively um, that, that people have had. And it's been done on a week by week um, basis. Um, and this just covers from the beginning of March until the end of June. And it gives you a really nice, powerful visual of of how countries have responded. So you can see, for example, India has been quite knee-jerk compared to Sweden, which was much more relaxed and very consistent. So, so what you see from this is the kind of, you know, consistency um, and, and how they've reacted um, over time and that sort of thing. Another thing that we're also looking at as well is, um, and this is just an, an, an example uh, contrasting Brazil um, and Kenya. And what you'll see again, it's week by week. These are new cases. So it's not cumulative cases, it's new cases that happen each week. And you'll see that uh, the purple is the project lockdown index and the green are the number of new cases each week. So what we can do is we can start to have a look and see, um, you know, can we see some correlations between, you know, how, how the lockdowns affected uh, the number of cases? We've had a lot of challenges, and I think Mandy was starting to talk about um, some of those challenges. Similar to um, the provinces, we've had the same issues of um, losing sources and that kind of thing. And it is a very complex. You can imagine that um, with the complexity of these government measures, it's a very complex data entry process. 
We've had difficulties with the sources that we use. We use um, ACAPS, which is a UN OCHA um, system. Um, we've also had a lot of difficulty, as you can imagine, uh, trying to, to bring in uh, people with the right languages for all the different governments. But I think more than anything, it's been the inconsistency with how governments have implemented these measures um, and how they report on them. At a kind of higher level um, across the, uh, our entire organization, of course, funding um, is a challenge for us as well as because we're a total volunteer driven um, initiative. So it's, you know, how do we recruit? How do we retain them? How do we get the specializations that we need? And how do we deal with the fact that we are really literally all over the world? So at the moment, we have volunteers across 15 time zones. So you can imagine the kind of project management issues that we're also facing. Solutions wise, in terms of how we are overcoming some of those challenges, um, we're really looking now to engage a broader community. So we reach, we're going to be using GitHub um, much more, reaching out to civic tech networks, um, partnering with universities. And also um, a kind of more interesting side of things is that we're looking at different data funnels. Um, and just to draw your attention to a couple of them. So um, as I said, the editing process is very complex, but we're looking at uh, crowdsourcing our data entry. But also we're looking um, at the moment we're working on a machine learning. So we want to automate. So that whole process of finding sources or finding that they're missing um, and then needing to enter all that data, um, we're going to be using natural language processing to help us do this. Um, but really, we want to automate that. So that's a really exciting way forward. And none of these other initiatives um, are doing this at the moment. They're, they continue to use um, you know, people power type thing. So I'm going to hand you back uh, to Mark now to kind of um, recap and, um, and throw some questions out to you. Thanks, Mark. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, so we do have 10 minutes left, and we have quite a bit of questions um, that are over at the slide.do page. And I think there, there, that's plenty for us to discuss in 10 minutes. So I would like to know uh, if you girls had the opportunity to have a look at any of them. I posted them in chat. And if there is any in particular that you would like to tackle so that we can start uh, by, oh, doing that one in particular. Howomfeangsiprojectdown So okay, I'll try I'll just draw one to you to you. Uh this one is it seems like governments who can easily track citizens by GPS or restrict citizen movements have a better handle in the pandemic. Does N justify the means? This is a difficult one, but I opened the question to, to you both. How does this go? How do we balance? I think the fundamental question here is, how do we balance privacy, human rights, and at the same time, focus on keeping people safe? Any thoughts on that? Julie, no, no burning thoughts on that one. Did you want me to answer the? Like, there's a couple of other questions there that have been thrown up. Should I yeah. answer those? What, whatever you prefer. <laughs> so I, I will. I'll just have a look because someone had asked about um, whether government should be given the benefit of the doubt for using drastic me measures. Um, to deal with COVID. And I guess it, it really depends on whether you prioritize, you know, public health and that kind of thing, or whether, you know, you're prioritizing rights. Um, and I think that what we're going to find down the line is that there's been a tremendous impact, you know, on people's mental health, um, you know, on their ability to be part of a community. Like, have we totally changed what the meaning of community is? Have we totally changed what it is to socialize and to trust people and to to be able to be less than two meters from someone, you know what I mean? And if somebody coughs. Um, so I think I, 
I don't know um, that it has been, I think, perhaps to start with, but I think now, um, you know, some of these very drastic measures, perhaps they need to be starting to think more about rights. Um, somebody also asked about whether um, during the third wave, um, yes, I think perhaps it's been more reactionary because they have started to learn a little bit more how to cope with, the, with COVID. Um, and I think what's happened is it's for territories that are be reaching out to their communities and working with their communities, I think then yes. Um, but for places like the UK, for example, um, and they flip-flop um, a lot of the time um, and they're not working with, you know, communities or local leaders. Um, so I think that's been um, very difficult as well. Somebody also asks about um, comparing government measures taken in China versus measures taken in EU. Are human rights standards that you measure too relative or absolute? Yeah, so um, they are absolute. You can measure them um, relatively as well. But we're using um, the United Nations um, Declaration of Human Rights. So for our COVID data set layer, each of our data points relates to one of the human rights um, from the declaration. So very much they are um, absolute. I, I hope that answers um, all those questions. Mark, did you want to do a kind of wrap-ups now? Uh, I, I would like to ask Mandy if she has anything to add on that, and I'll move on to the, to the wrap-up, yes. Um, I think these are very interesting questions, and I believe that uh, our project indeed <laughs> help stimulate your thoughts and help encourage you to think more about the human rights perspective uh, affected by the lockdown situation and under the coronavirus. So thank you. Perfect. So with that, uh, we start to, to end the session. And we really want to reach out to people. We want to see uh, a lot of interaction, particularly with governments. Uh, we want to be able to discuss with the governments as well, because that's where we're getting our data from. And it's something that we're sort of lacking at the moment is this direct connection with governments. We would like to hear their side as well. And we really need to, to have ideas, have people coming in and bringing more to this project. Because as you can see, we have already accomplished a lot but our goals are big. And as we move on, we hope to keep expanding towards something that uh, actually encapsulates all the, that we discussed today. How do we understand human rights? How do we actually act upon them? How do we actually convert this into policies that help people? And those are questions that we have yet to answer. We are getting there, I think. We slowly but surely are getting there. But we can only do that with your collaboration. We can only do that with when people raise their hand and say, okay, I have something to add. So if you are from any, any stakeholder group, any group of interest, let's say, and you would like to participate, just reach out to us. You can easily find us. Uh, I think on the next slide, uh, you can see exactly that. So, um, you can help in, in any of that. And yeah, one more. There's a, there's also a bunch of acknowledgements. Oh, wow, that's a lot of acknowledgements, but thank you to everyone involved there. I won't be able to read uh, from each, but still, thank you very much. And on the final slide, we have the actual contact. So please contact us uh, so over here, um, we would really like um, to join the conference and be able to talk more about this. Uh, we have a lot of different data points that we can bring. We have different discussions we can bring. We try to synthesize as much as we could, but there is just so much more. Julie, would you like to jump in? I was just going to um, just maybe uh, draw some more attention perhaps 
as we do have a little bit more time, and, um, and if, if anybody has any more questions, we'd be happy to do those too. Um, just a little bit more to some of the features under development, because like Mark said, um, it's a big project and there's lots going on and we probably only captured, you know, a small, a small set of it. Um, but one of the things, we've talked a lot about the COVID-19 data set layer because, you know, that's what we started with and that's what we've been very focused on and it's a very big data set layer. But we are working on lots of new different data set layers as well. So the next one will be a contact tracing um, apps data set. We're looking at um, elections because, of course, that's been a very pertinent issue um, during this whole time as well. Um, but we're also very interested to, to hear, to work with organizations and hear from people that have other ideas. So, for example, at the moment, we're talking with some organizations about sex workers' rights. Um, so um, if you think of Project Lockdown as this platform for all sorts of different, you know, not just COVID, um, but lots of different data set layers, um, we're looking more and more at breaking down territories because we found, for example, Germany did nothing. Germany doesn't have that kind of centralization um, and everything was done at, at a state level. Um, so we've been trying to, you know, look more at, at that. We talked about the um, data funnels as well. Um, we're setting up an internship program, which is a very exciting. We've had a couple of interns coming through and we're building on that. So that's also a very exciting thing. And we've got lots and lots of kind of, you know, user interface technical features um, that we're also working on um, and kind of making it sort of, you know, better and better, the kind of press play type thing as well. Is there anything else? Uh, I don't know if anybody has any questions or Mark, you want to add any other final remarks in our last couple of minutes? I think we're super good. We can wrap up on time and be very tidy and very neat. So I would like to thank you both for joining us here. This was so interesting, like so much knowledge. Even being someone that follows the project closely, it's impressive how much there is actually going on and how much you are managing together. So big thank you to, to both of you. Uh, it's been a pleasure. And everyone, reach out to us. We are always willing to talk. And have a great day. Talk to you. See you all very soon. Thank you okay. so much. And do, do join us at the UN conference. Thank you.